Okay, we're in the Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 17, and we'll be discussing verses 20 uh, down to 37 today. Um, <clears throat> we're told in verse 20 that uh, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. <clears throat> From our study of the book of Luke, we gather that the Pharisees, Sadducees, the scribes and the people were all looking for a messianic king like David who would muster up an army of Israelites to conquer the whole world for God. You can read in Isaiah 60, 10 through 17, uh, somewhat of that notion. Now such a scenario would of necessity be with signs to be observed. You couldn't amass an army, you couldn't declare war on the end uh, or, or on the rest of the world uh, and not have some sort of signs that this is what's going to happen. Uh, and uh, so when Jesus says um, uh, that uh, there, there's this kingdom, the kingdom is not coming with signs to be observed. He's actually hitting out at something they believed, that it would be with signs to be observed, and that we necessarily need to look out for those signs. And it will be very obvious that uh, the kingdom of heaven is coming. But um, Jesus knocks such a notion on the head. He answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. In my own mind, I think uh, the people who uh, are looking forward to the kingdom uh, being established, because they don't believe it's been established yet, looking forward to Jesus coming back to the earth with all the signs and all the wonders of, of th that that might entail to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and to rule the world from Jerusalem, they've fallen into the same trap they've fallen into the same trap as the Jews had fallen into back in the first century. And this verse alone would, should sound out a warning to them that it's just, even if it was to come in the future, which we don't believe, it's established already. We know that from Acts chapter 2. Christ is ruling in heaven. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're in the kingdom. We've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son. So it's all, it's all going on right now. Christ is ruling. He's ruling the whole universe. And in particular, he's ruling over the earth and all nations and all people in those nations, ourselves included. Now, it seems, getting back to that generation, it seems that Israel at the time had believed the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 2, 44 and 45. Remember when uh, the, the, he saw this big image uh, and the head was of gold, and the breast was of uh, silver, was it? And, and the rest was of bronze, and the legs were of iron, and the feet was of iron and clay. And they represented four <coughs> kingdoms, worldwide kingdoms. The Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, and the Roman Empire. And it was in the days of those kings, as they amalgamated, as it were, in the Roman Empire, the strongest and the fiercest of all uh, the worldwide um, uh, kingdoms, uh, the kingdom of God was to be established in that period of time. So <clears throat> they must have understood that, uh, that in the time of the Roman Empire the kingdom of heaven would be established so they were expecting the kingdom to be established by Messiah in their generation that's why there was such great expectation now as John uh, the Baptist and Jesus preached repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand uh, Matthew chapter 3 1 and 2 and chapter 4 verse 17 their message would have intensified 
that expectation. Now, the common perception, as we said then among the Jews in that generation, was of a worldly kingdom. They longed to see a physical king with his own army sitting on an earthly throne in Jerusalem and ruling over all the nations of the earth from the land of Israel, its headquarters. Again, I want to tell you, there's people who believe that that's what's still going to happen. However, the kingdom of Christ was not to be an earthly kingdom. An earthly physical kingdom in that way. How do we know that? Well, we know it because of what he said to uh, Pilate in John chapter 18, verse 36. Let's look at John chapter 18, verse 36. <clears throat> he says there, <clears throat> Pilate had asked him, verse 33, Pilate entered again into the <coughs> praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Let that sink in, brethren. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, a physical, natural kingdom established on this earth with a physical king sitting in a physical place <coughs> ruling from a physical city, it's not going to happen. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting. And they, the people who predict that that's going to happen in the future, will have Jesus amassing an army to fight against all the evil nations, to overcome them by killing and murdering and all the rest of it, and slaying the wicked, My servants would be fighting, he says, if this were the case. And they weren't fighting. They weren't even seeking to deliver Jesus at the time. He says, they would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. It's just not of this realm. So when they come to us with all these theories about Jesus coming again to, um, to rule, rule in Jerusalem over the whole world. You don't believe them. It's not true. Jesus says the kingdom is not of this realm at all. And his spiritual kingdom, when it, when it would be established would be reserved for those among the Jews who were humbly seeking the kingdom of heaven. They were the little flock or the remnant. Romans chapter 11, 3 to 5. That was worlds away from what they believed the kingdom was going to be. Now since the the spiritual kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. It could be said, it could not be said, I should say, look, here it is, or there it is. That's what verse 21 says. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst, he says. But what does that mean, the kingdom of God is in your midst? It means Jesus the King was in their midst. I know there's a um, translation that said it is within you. Now as a spiritual kingdom, 
There's nothing wrong with that. It is within us. We're within it and it's within us. Just as Christ is within us and we're within him. So we're in the kingdom. But he says uh, to them at, at that stage, he says um, that the kingdom of God is in your midst already. And it means that Jesus, the king, was in their midst. Remember now, he had worked the supernatural works of God before their eyes as proof of his claims. He had even taught them the laws of the kingdom from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7. He fulfilled all the messianic prophecies made in the Old Testament, Acts chapter 3, 23 to 25. Yet despite being told, behold, the kingdom of God in the person of the king is in your midst, they, the Jews, seeing, could not see. In the end, the hierarchy had decided, we have no king but Caesar. No king but Caesar. That was a denial of God's rule over Israel. Of course, they had done that from the time that they asked for a king in Samuel's day. And God gave them the, the king. And Samuel was very upset about it. He fe felt it was a rejection of him. He said, God said to him, no, it's not a rejection of you, Samuel. It's a rejection of me. They don't want me to rule over them. And that's so it has been all through the ages for the Jews. They made a pretense of God being the ruler over all of them, which he was. But they didn't want him to be the ruler over all of them. And when Jesus came, they didn't want him to rule over them either. So we have no king but Caesar is where they ended up in terms of having a king. Now Jesus realized when talking about the kingdom that the days to come before the judgment because of their rejection of the kingdom were dangerous days for the disciples. In those dark days of opposition, rejection and persecution they would hanker for the security, comfort and peace they had experienced when Christ was with them. Now that's, that's very important for us to see. When, when they were with Jesus, there was all, all this conversation going on. They saw the miracles. They even were given the power to work miracles themselves. They uh, trusted Jesus. They, as Peter said, you, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. They began to, their eyes were opened unto, unto that that he came down from heaven, they believed he was sent down from heaven by God, and that he and the Father were one. It was quite remarkable that they could settle into such a belief, but they did. However, the rest of their Jewish brethren didn't accept it. And there was terrible chaos before the judgment that would befall them. Uh, and those days were hard days for the Christians. Jesus anticipating the chaos out of which they would long to see one of the days of the Son of Man in which they shared his love, heard his words, and gloried in the works of compassion for the downtrodden in the Jewish community. It must have been a remarkable experience. Not just because Jesus was who he was, God, that uh, he never sinned, that he was the most loving human being that ever walked the face of the earth, and to be in his company. And I, I feel it uh, now in, this, in the sense that I, I never feel out of place when I talk about or talk to Jesus or talk about Jesus. And I never feel there's a, a condemnation on me or a rejection of me. I can feel that he loves me and that he accepts me for who I am. Now, a lot of human beings won't even do that for us. They won't accept you for who you are. 
They want you to be someone different. And if you don't conform to their ideal of who you're supposed to be, they don't want to know you. But Jesus never does that. He knows you. He knows he had known you when you were at your worst before you became a Christian. And he still loved you. So now that you're a Christian, he's never going to abandon you. And we must try to experience that love and, and that fellowship which the apostles had with him for the three and a half years that he was with them. And they were so, so, so comforted by his presence that when the hard days come, came or the dark days came, they would long for one of the days, just one of the days, and I suppose we all can uh, see that or understand that. If we lo lose somebody that we're so close to, that we've loved and, and have been loved by, it, 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 uh, it, there are times when in thinking about them, you would say, I wish I just could have them back for one day so that we might en enjoy that peace and that harmony and that joy and that love. But it never returns, you see. Some of his disciples uh, needed Christ's personal presence so much that it almost became a snare for them. So much so that some would succumb to the temptation Jesus reveals in this story here. Uh, that they would succumb to the temptation to run after those who were saying, look, here, as if Christ had returned to the earth. He's trying to tell them, look, if when your, your, your wish for to be in my presence again is go, can become a stumbling block for you because you'll want it so desperately that when people say, look, here, here he is, you will... You could almost be, pers be persuaded that he was there because it's what you wanted. The only thing that would prevent them from being carried away by their own wishful thinking was remembering Christ's words, do not go away and do not run after them. So when you hear about, oh, Jesus has returned and he's here and he's there, don't talk. That's just rubbish. Just don't. The, the next time Jesus comes, he'll come in his personal glory. The presence of the Lord will be seen as lightning is seen in the sky, from one end of the sky to the other. There's, there will be no doubt as to what we're seeing. And nobody will have to tell us, look here or look there. Everybody, every eye will see him when he comes again on the last day. Every eye will see him. So we don't need any of these stories that are going to emerge before that actually happens. Now, when we get to verse 24, it says, for just like the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Now, it seems to me that um, Christ um, or Jesus telescopes two judgments together. The judgment of his second coming with the judgment of the Jewish nation in the destruction of Jerusalem. The telescope of God's word allows us to see clearly the judgment of the second coming in the distant eschatological, that's the theological phrase for this uh, period of time, eschatological future. And that will be as easily seen as the judgment of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel in the historical present, so to speak. So here the word of God gives us, through Jesus Christ our Lord, a vision of what's going to happen when Jesus comes on the last day in it personally. His presence will be in that coming 
We will see him just as he is. We will be transformed as we're raised from the dead into his image and share in his glory. So, primarily in verse 24, Jesus describes his own personal glory when he comes to judge the world on the last day. But he does it so that, or so as to remind the disciples not to look for his personal presence when he comes to judge Jerusalem. There will be a universal judgment, there will be a local judgment as we're going to see. But he, he's reminding them about his personal presence and how visible it will be but that will not be the case when it comes to the judgment on Jerusalem. Um, even though it's not going to be the case in Jerusalem, they will see a demonstration of his kingdom power when Jerusalem is destroyed. His day being a day of glorification for him, but a day of utter humiliation for the wicked. And we need to grasp that. Jesus is coming back to be glorified. The days of his humiliation, the days of his suffering, the days of rejection are all gone for Jesus Christ. He's passed through that time period and he passed through it very successfully. But now that he's glorified, he is over all and judge of all. He is the one with the power to raise up every single human being from the graves. He is going to be the one who will lead them to the judgment seat and then pronounce judgment on every single human being for the deeds that they have done in the body according to what they have done, whether good or bad. That's the power that Jesus possesses as the Messiah. <clears throat> However, before these judgments happen, Jesus tells them he must suffer many things and be rejected by his, this generation. Now by saying that, in this statement, he makes it clear that the judge, his judgment on Israel was not going to be immediate. There was going to be a time period between him ascending into heaven and the judgment that will come on Jerusalem. From that time forth, Jesus told him in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Matthew 16 verse 21. So that's all got to happen before the judgment comes. Now they had been warned then of the judgments to come. It was imperative for them to prepare to meet their God. Now when you make a statement like that, that is monumental. It is huge. There's nothing that can compare to having to prepare to meet your God. Face to face. Exposed as to your life and what you've done and what you've said. open and naked, as it were, laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's going to be the situation with us. So all of the hidden things will be revealed. You can't hide away from God. You can't be keeping secrets from God. You can't have done things under many people 
that there's many of the dead which will be raised up to tell the story of who murdered them, who poisoned them, who abused them, who did all the things that uh, shouldn't have been done to them. And those people who were the perpetrators, they're going to be faced with the whole bank shoot on the judgment day. And their mouths will be shut because they'll have no excuses. They will not be able to bribe this judge. They will not be able to talk their way out of it. They will not be able to impress others as to what they were. It will be evident what they were and what they are and where they're going and why they're going there. They were to prepare to meet their God. Now the flood of Noah's day was a worldwide judgment. Whereas the judgment in the days of Lot was a local judgment. You'll, you'll, you'll see that both are mentioned here. Verse 26, and just as it happened in the days of Noah. But he's trying to teach them a lesson. He's trying to say to them, I want you to be prepared, but in these examples, the people were not prepared for the judgment that befell them. Just as it happened in the days of Noah, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage, we're told. What's he trying to get across to them? He's trying to get across that the people were so engrossed in this world, in this life, in of the day-to-day -day things that happen to us in this life, they are so overwhelmed. No, they, they welcomed being overwhelmed. They participated in being overwhelmed by all of these things, as if all of these things were the be-all and the end-all, the most important things for us, for this life, and for the next life. It was like you're building an empire in order to take it with you when you die, which is not going to happen. It can't happen. They were engrossed in this life and were not expecting the judgment until the day that Noah entered the ark, or if it's the second coming, until the day Jesus comes again. Or if it was the coming in Jerusalem and the judgment on Jerusalem until the day that the Roman armies surrounded Jerusalem. And the floods came. And the judgment will did come on Jerusalem. And the judgment will come on the last day. And destroy them all. That's not destroy us, but destroy the wicked. This warning is for Christ's disciples so that they will not be caught unprepared. I mean, it's going to be bad enough that the people of the world will be not expecting anything like it. They will be unprepared for it. It'll be a shock to their system. They'll be dumbfounded by what they see. They will be rattling, shaking in their boots because of the power of the of the great God, our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ our Lord, as he comes in his glory and his power and his might as judge of all the earth. That will be the situation that they'll be facing. Now even, he uses another example, the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. The days of Lot was the signpost of a future local judgment on Jerusalem and Israel. In the days of Lot they were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on that day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Just imagine, just imagine when you're going about your business, you're thinking, you're planning for weddings, you're planning, you're planning for parties, you're planning to go on holidays, you're planning to do all these, these things, everything. 
you know, all of life is, is, is in your control. You're, you're controlling your life and you're planning, planning it out for yourself. And suddenly, unexpectedly, it all happens. It all happens. Now when the, when the course, we'll know from other passages, when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, it uh, actually pulled back. This was an opportunity that was given to all of the Christians who believed Jesus Christ to get out of there and to go run to safety, away from the place. But for those who didn't believe Jesus, they just stayed there, thought, oh, that's grand. <laughs> I got a bit of a fright there, now everything's going to be all right. But they came back and they destroyed the place. And all the lives, millions, died in that uh, whole judgment. In the days of Lot, the five cities of the plains were spiritually unprepared for what was coming. And that was, to be, that was to be a warning to the hierarchy who are turning people away from Jesus Christ our Lord. It was to be a warning for the people. Don't get wrapped up in this life. You be expecting what's coming and preparing for it. Don't, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was a, it's a, a warning for the whole world now that things are not going to say, stay the same way as they are one day it'll all be wrapped up, it'll be finished and there'll be no more earth for you to indulge yourself in. Nothing but eternity. So a warning to the hierarchy and the Jewish people and the believers to prepare themselves spiritually before the Romans came to destroy the Jewish capital, Jerusalem and the nation. The lesson is, in both Noah's day and Lot's day, whether it's a universal judgment or a local judgment, the populations were spiritually unprepared for what was about to befall them. You can see just how into this life they were. They were so into this life and material possessions that on that day, the destruction of Jerusalem, when they would see, or seem to be where, when there, oh, sorry, where there would seem to be a possibility of saving some of their cherished worldly possessions, some of who were on the housetops would go down to take out what they could carry away with them, or for the one who was in the field, he might go back to the house to get his cloak. You see, this is what life is. Life consists of our possessions. We think the more possessions we've got, the more life we've got. Life does not consist in your possessions. When you get really sick and you're facing death in hospital, you will realize that your life does not consist of your possessions. You would give all your possessions to save your life. We need to understand that. We need to get rid of this thought that this is the be all and the end all it's not we're passing through we're sojourners here we're like those caravans that used to go through the deserts in, in, the, in the patriarchal times they pitched their tents wherever they could but they hadn't got homes their journey through life was a journey and there was no settlements in it. They were so into this life though that they tried to, to bring it with them as if it would help. But the warning for such crisis is and this, this is a warning if your house went on fire. This is a warning if there was an explosion, this is a warning if there's some terrible gale comes along that threatens our lives. Forget what you can take with you. Leave it behind you. 
it'll slow you down in getting out of that dangerous out of that dangerous situation if you can just save your own life under those circumstances you will do well because your possessions will weigh you down they won't deliver you from the danger that is there Lot's wife is, is a, a, a huge example for us in defiance of God's warning not to look back. Now she was on her way out. She was being delivered from what was going to happen or what began to happen in Sodom. Lot's wife looked back to Sodom. Why did she look back to Sodom? It wasn't just that she, because she wanted to be disobedient to God. Uh, it was because Sodom was her home. She had a home there. She had a life there. She had a, a standing in the community there. She's a woman of importance there. Her possessions were there. And most of all, her heart was there. That's where her heart was. The story of Lot's wife begs this question. What is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? She was turned into a pillar of salt. She may have looked back, but she'd never go back. It was finished for her. We need to remember we brought nothing into the world. You came in naked. Nothing. You hadn't got a penny in your skin. You had nothing. And you'll go out that way as well. They might dress you in a suit or put a habit on you. But you're still, you're still <laughs> naked. You haven't got anything else with you. Oh, okay. The truth is, friends, if... We want real life. You must be prepared to give up the lesser for the greater. Your mortal life must become of less importance to you than your eternal life. Whoever seeks to keep his life, and let me put in his mortal life, this fleshly, human, earthly life, whoever seeks to keep this life will lose it. Because one day you're going to die anyway. You're going to lose it all anyway. And whoever loses his life, that is this fleshly, mortal life, in the sense that we surrender our life to Christ, will preserve that life. So that's the options for us. We seek to keep this life that is so important to us and we'll lose it and we'll lose everything else beyond this life. Or we submit this life of mine and of yours to the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might become his disciples and might live according to his will and his way and in doing that I will gain life both on this earth and in the world to come. You know, this life, this fleshly, earthly life, is a fleeting experience. It will soon come to an end. And it cannot be compared to the eternal, uncreated, glorious life of God in Christ Jesus our Lord which incidentally you possess it's yours now now you can ruin it you can throw it away you can not think about it you can be dismissive but you have this life and it will be absolutely tragic 
if one day the Lord comes again and you've been sowing to the flesh and reaping all the benefits of this world rather than sowing to the Spirit and reaping all the benefits of the kingdom of heaven. It will be a great loss and you'll have eternity to mourn about. Now, recognize all God's judgments are to separate the wicked from the righteous. That was true in the destruction of Jerusalem when the Roman, army, Roman armies took one from the bed and to take them as a slave or killed the other one and left them there in the bed. One, uh, they took one woman from the grinding stone to be a slave and killed the other one that was working with her. There's a separation. It will be true also when Christ comes again on the clouds of heaven. Those who are his will be raised up from the air to join him in the clouds to ever be with the Lord. And those who are not raised up to be with him in the clouds will be destroyed. After all of this teaching, they questioned him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Where? I don't think they really wanted to know about this. But anyway, in judgment, Jesus, the judge of all the earth, will say, Bring these enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them. Bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now this is the Lamb of God, the meek and gentle Jesus. But in his role as God, he will just deal with it as it is, with no partiality. Everybody will be justly judged, and if you're condemned, you will be justly and fairly condemned. It will be the choice that you have made in this life that will allow you to be condemned so you have no reason to complain none whatsoever it was what you wanted whether you knew it or not you wanted it more than you wanted eternal life you wanted it more than you wanted Jesus Christ our Lord or the heavenly kingdom so you will you won't, you won't be able to make a peep in defense of yourself you will be cut out for your worldly mindedness. So when the Son of Man is revealed in his personal presence, in his glory, in the second coming, will you be ready? Now I know there's a lot of people saying, he's coming soon. Do you know what? They might be right. But they don't know. Of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the Son, when he was here on this earth. Only the Father. So all their guesses are just that, guesses. But if he was to come today, would you be ready? Brethren, we cannot go on living as if there is no tomorrow. We must learn the lesson and be prepared every day to meet our God. That's the moral of this story. It was for those Jesus was teaching at that time in Luke chapter 17. It is for us today. It's a serious matter to be a Christian. And it's a serious matter not to be a Christian. Just think about that. I'll leave it with you.